Hello and welcome to this video on psychological harm. This is part of paper two, tort law, and it's very much linked to negligence. So this is a special kind of liability. So we're looking to see how we go about proving if somebody is liable for psychological harm. So the term psychological harm can be used interchangeably with psychiatric damage and psychiatric injury. So you'll find that we'll use a few of those different phrases in this video. But psychiatric injury is injury to the mind rather than the body, and it's sometimes referred to also as nervous shock. Now claimants must show using medical evidence that they have a recognised psychiatric injury, and the claimants will not succeed in claims for normal grief or distress. So it does need to be a psychiatric injury, and this video will discuss the requirements for a successful claim. So before we move any further, just a pause and a bit of an exam hint. So this issue of psychiatric harm is an extension of ordinary negligence. So the claimant has to show the same things as ordinary damage and ordinary negligence. So duty of care, breach and causation. However, the courts are more reluctant to allow claims for psychiatric harm. So they've adopted a restrictive approach on when the duty of care is owed. Now, in your exam, this issue could be a problem question on its own. For example, a person suffers psychiatric harm, either in addition to or instead of physical harm. And it could also be linked to a larger problem question concerning negligence. So, for example, negligence has been committed by person A and injures or kills person B. Now, person C may witness the accident or be related to person B and may suffer psychiatric harm as a result. So they might build into a larger question there, but it just depends on the scenario as to how to apply the law. So we need to be aware of all the possibilities and the way this can come up. So the overall requirements for psychiatric injury are that negligence must be proven. There must be a recognized psychiatric injury. And then there are different rules whether the claimant is a primary victim or a secondary victim and of course you need to identify that first and only apply and discuss what is applicable to the scenario at hand. We're going to begin then with this concept or recap of negligence and that it must be proven. Now negligence of course we need to establish a duty of care and that the defendant fell below that duty um, and of course caused the damage and we won't go into that in too much depth in this video. There is a, another video discussing negligence. Now, these tests establish if a duty should arise in this situation. So the courts have adopted a restrictive approach. And the tests we're going to discuss in this video are whether we, we meet the threshold. And if the claimant does meet that threshold, then it can claim for the injury itself. So once we've established the negligence must be proven, we go on to look at whether there is a site recognized psychiatric injury. So a recognized psychiatric injury is a recognized psychiatric illness which is medically verified. So this could be, for example, a long term psychiatric consequence of a shocking event. For example, PTSD is the most common, but you might also see extreme anxiety and reactive depression as symptoms in your or conditions in your exam. So this typically stems or is caused from an event which threatens death or serious injury to the claimant or to someone they're physically close to. And of course, we mentioned already that grief, emotion, stress and shock are all excluded from this particular type of claim. The case of Frost and the Chief Constable of South Yorkshire Police suggest that the issue of psychiatric injury is a matter of expert evidence. And so we need a doctor or a psychiatrist to give evidence in support of a psychiatric injury. In Riley and Merseyside Health Authority, the couple in this uh, particular case became trapped in a lift and they became claustrophobic and fearful and very upset. And they suffered nightmares and difficulty sleeping for several days afterwards. But this was considered not to be a psychiatric disorder, only emotion, and it needs gives you the definition or the idea that it needs to be an identifiable psychiatric condition. So this was unsuccessful, but it gives you the idea of what it needs to be. Now, there are two types of claimants then. So we have one set of rules for primary victims and one set of rules for secondary victims. And of course, we're going to deal with primary victims first. 
So we do need to be aware then there is a restrictive approach and traditionally there's a historical unwillingness to treat mental illnesses seriously. There is also a difficulty in diagnosis. You know, we would have to in essence get inside somebody's head to establish exactly what is going on. So it's diagnosis is notoriously difficult in these circumstances to, to make. There is also the potential risk of fraudulent claims and this might be at the forefront of the court mind. And indeed there may be the floodgates argument, um, this idea of public policy. So a limited people might be physically injured by an event but there might be a much larger number that are psychiatric dam psychiatrically damaged and for example if you look at the Hillsborough disaster in 1989 from which some of the rules we're going to discuss today come from. Um, you can understand that the floodgates um, in that particular case will be opened and there will be too many claims. So in that case against the police, they would have that many claims that the sort of money available or resources available would not be available for policing. So there is a public policy to limit those particular types of claims. So as mentioned, initially judges were suspicious of claimants with mental injuries and a claim could only be made if the claimant suffered mental injury as a result of fearing for his or her own safety, as in Dilau and White. Um, and in this case, the claimant was working in a bar when, as a result of an accident in the street outside, a coaching horse has crashed into the bar. Now, the claimant here suffered for her own safety and her claim was allowable because she feared for its danger. And it was real and immediate fear of personal danger in this case. In Hambrook and Stokes, a mother was walking with her children along a pavement when the runaway lorry passed her. She had a crash ahead of her and also that the lorry was involved in an accident involving a child. She suffered severe shock as she feared for the safety of her children. Now a claim was allowed and as a result a claim could be made by those suffering shock due to fearing for the safety of a family member. And in Bull Hill and Young, a famous case, a pregnant fishwife had had an accident involving a motorbike as she was getting off a tram. She went to look at the scene and when she saw blood on the road she suffered such shock that she miscarried. Now a claim against the estate of the dead motorcyclist who had caused the accident failed as she was not related to him and she was not within the range of people who could be foreseen as suffering shock. There was no proximity of relationship between her and the motorcyclist. And so the decision confirmed this previous case that in order to claim for mental injury had to be suffered from an injury to oneself or a member of the family and the person able to claim must fall within a foreseeable range of people. McLaughlin and O'Brien obviously is the opposite in terms of the outcomes. Um, Mrs McLaughlin's husband and children in this case were involved in a car accident due to the negligence of a lorry driver. She was at home and was informed of the incident and she went to hospital where her family were being treated. Now she suffered shock when she saw them there and, and learned the death of one of her children. Now two principles were set by the House of Lords which extended the rules for claiming nervous shock further. Number one was a claim can be made by someone or close ties to love and affection with the victim of the accident. And number two, that shock could be suffered either at the scene of the accident or within its immediate aftermath. So there was no time set for this, but Mrs. McLaughlin arrived at the hospital within two hours of the accident. And before this case, a claim could only be made by somebody at the scene of the accident. So this led to develop the law that bit more. In Vernon and Bosley, a father witnessed his children being drowned in a car, negligently driven by their nanny, and he recovered damages from nervous shock that was held to be partly as a result of the pathological grief and bereavement, but also part of the consequence of the trauma of witnessing the events. So these all kind of look at the idea of a recognised psychiatric injury, but we now need to look at the separate rules those for primary victims and those for secondary victims. So primary victims are people who are di either directly involved in an accident and suffer psychiatric injury in the aftermath or they're in the zone of danger. Now this is an ordinary negligence claim but with just psychiatric harm is the damage. So you can claim in this case for psychiatric damage even if they've escaped injury, physical injury that is, and it doesn't matter if the psychiatric harm was not reasonably foreseeable as long as some harm was foreseeable. 
and the rescuer can be considered the primary victim, for example, if the claimant puts himself in the zone of danger and was rescuing people. So what we see here is more of an adaption of the rules of negligence than we do sets of rules for a particular type of victim. If we look at Page and Smith, the claimant here suffered from ME, which is a chronic fatigue syndrome, before the accident. Now, he was in recovery when he was involved and in a minor car accident due to the defendant's negligence. Now, he was not physically injured, but the accident triggered a dysemi, which became chronic and permanent. Now, as a result, he was unable to return to his job as a teacher. The House of Lords decided here that that provided some kind of personal injury was foreseeable. It didn't matter whether the injury was physical or psychiatric, and so the distinction was made between primary and secondary victims. In addition, it would have it said that the fact the ordinary person would have suffered the injury incurred by the claim was irrelevant. The defendants must take their victims as they find them under the thin skull rule. So this really illustrates a few points, but the point we're trying to make here is in the judgment it was considered a psychiatric injury was applicable. In Donaghy and the Chief Constable of Greater Manchester Police, here the claimant was a police officer who was required to attach a tracking device to the underside of a car belonging to a suspected gang of criminals while a gang were drinking in a pub. Due to police negligence, the device was defective and he had to make nine trips to the car before it worked and he suffered psychiatric damage and a stroke as the risk grew each time. Now the device was effective, so it prevented the officer from carrying out the task and it made the risk greater. Here, some harm was foreseeable and so the psychiatric injury was able to be claimed for. If we look at White and the Chief Constable of South Yorkshire Police, the claimants here were police officers who attended the scene of the Hillsborough disaster. Now, although they undoubtedly suffered psychiatric damage through witnessing horrific scenes, they never feared for their own safety and were not in any danger, and so therefore they would, could not claim uh, successfully for the psychiatric injury. In Chadwick and British Rail, the claimant helped victims of the Lewisham train crash, which occurred close to his home. Now, because of his small size, he was encouraged to crawl into the wreckage and give injections and comfort to trapped passengers. As a result of his experience, he suffered mental injuries. Now, his claim against the negligent railway authority was successful, as the court considered he was a primary victim at risk to himself, and it did not want to discourage members from the public from rescuing if required. Usually these days, only professional rescuers who put themselves at risk will be able to claim. If we look at Hale and London Underground, again, it was rescuers in this case, and a fire attending the King's Cross Station fire successfully claimed for the post-traumatic stress disorder he suffered as a result of his experience in the rescue attempts. This is because rescuers who put themselves in danger are classified as primary victims. However, if rescuers don't put themselves in physically at risk, they are secondary victims and will then have to satisfy the Alcock criteria instead. So what we can do is compare some cases. Rescuers where there's no danger will not, will not be able to claim, but those who do put themselves in danger become primary victims. So once we've looked at the rules of primary victims, remember in a scenario you might have one primary victim and one secondary victim, for example, and may have to discuss both. If not, you need to be selective and accurate as to the particular rules you need to use in any given scenario. So now we're going to look at the rules for secondary victims. So rules for secondary victims then is um, somebody who is not in physical, personal physical danger but witnessed an event or an aftermath. Now, as the scope for secondary victims is massive, the claimants must satisfy a number of different rules. So first of all, they need to satisfy all of Orcock's rules. They need to satisfy that the injury is caused by sudden shock. They need to satisfy the requirement for reasonable fortitude. And there's also an, ad an extra sort of thing to consider, a prime victim which owes, owes no duty to a secondary victim. So if somebody is injured and it's their fault, they don't owe a duty to anyone else if they are the person that gets injured. So what we'll do is look at each of these and I will refer to Alcock's rules as Alcock 1, 2 and 3, 
Of course, you shouldn't do that in your exam. This is for illustrative purposes. So just remember the three rules from Alcock and of course, remember the other rules as well. So the key case of Alcock and, and the Chief Constable of South Yorkshire Police stems from a series of cases which was brought by relatives and friends of those killed at Hillsborough. And the House of Lords realised the potential for unlimited liability. You know, people were claiming or, or had injuries from home uh, who witnessed it on the radio, seen it on television and so on. Now, of course, the scope is massive, so the courts had to reduce liability in this particular case. And so they come up with three qualifying criteria. You've seen some of these, or an adaption from the case of McLaughlin and O'Brien. The first is, the claimants must have a close tie of love and affection. The second, the claimants must be in proximity to the accident. And thirdly, the accident must be perceived by the claimant with his own senses. And so I put them into a six block. Alcock 1, 2 and 3 are the kind of three issues. But as I mentioned already, psychiatric injury needs to be caused by sudden shock. Claimant must possess reasonable fortitude and the primary victim does not owe a duty to a secondary victim. Now it's in this way, purely so you can structure your response in an accurate manner. This first one, this first kind of test which can come from Alcock. Uh, as I say, don't call, call it Alcock 1 in your exam. This just to illustrate there are three rules. So close tie love and affection between a claimant and a victim. Now, the claimant has to have close ties. This means that the relationship is of a close type of relationship and the relationship is close in fact. So this might be blood relationship or relationship because they're a close friend. Um, but it may not for all family members, for example, you could be closer to a boyfriend or girlfriend than you could be to a cousin, for example. So it needs to be proven both it's a normally a close type of relationship and that it in fact is close. So the defendant would have to prove this. Now, proving close ties of love and affection though, might be difficult because it might require gathering evidence of previous contacts, visits, phone calls, at a time when claimants are struggling with their illness or grief. Now, in today's sort of era, it would be probably a, bit, a little easier to, to consider how close people are, given that we have mobile phones. And of course, you might have pictures with this person, prove your phone calls, text message change, and so on. So it might be easier to prove now. But of course, at a time when they're grieving, it's not really fair to, to, to ask them to do that. So the second, second uh, test from Alcock then is that the claim must be in close proximity to the accident. Now, we've already seen in McLaughlin and O'Brien, the first case in which they allowed the claim when the person wasn't at the scene. So this has been developed, but there's a bit of discrepancy as to when this can happen. So there are some sort of artificial time limits. And again, put in place to limit liability and reduce the amount of people who can claim in any particular set of circumstances. So the claimant then should be present at the scene in order to claim. But in Alcock, it was decided this would exclude a claimant in another part of the stadium. So the courts are prepared to relax this rule slightly to allow a claim by a person who didn't witness the event but did immediate aftermath. But of course, it wouldn't be if there were many claimants, it'd be if there was one or two claimants instead. So this time limit of immediate aftermath was defined, but the two hour period in McLaughlin was approved. So what we look at here is it, it contrasts with some family members of the Hillsborough disaster victims who saw relatives in the morgue up to eight hours later. So it appears that proximity is more likely to be within that two hour mark than the eight hour mark from um, Alcock. So the closer to two hours, the more likely you are to be in the immediate aftermath. If you get to eight hours, then the chances are you'll be not in the immediate aftermath. Now, there are artificial time limits, but we need to develop what we know from case law. Now, whatever the length of time, though, a claim will be suffering and a mental injury uh, it would seem morally fair to award compensation, but of course, there are other arguments that we shouldn't. So the third element then from Alcock, the accident must be perceived by the claimant with his own senses. Common sense would tell you then that that doesn't include TV, radio and so on through the media. Or even if we, if we extend that to, to modern day, sort of seeing a video online or a live stream or something, that wouldn't be the same. 
So this includes sight, hearing and touch, but it's, it's not enough to be told about the, the issue um, or hear about it through the media. Now, if the claimant suffered a shock through watching television, listening to radio or hearing about it, then this criteria would not be satisfied. So there are the three issues from Alcock. We do then need to consider three other issues which have been developed through case law. The first of which is that it must be caused by sudden shock. So the psychiatric injury the claimant's claiming for is caused by sudden shock. This means it happens immediately. It doesn't occur later on or it's not through a gradual appreciation of events. So the usual claimant will be a victim who has suffered mental injury as a result of witnessing a sudden event so that the event happens suddenly and the shock happens suddenly too. But there have been attempts to extend the boundaries of claims of those who suffer mental injury as a result of gradual appreciation of events. Uh, we'll look at this and um, so the court have been accepting where there have been few claimants. If we look at Cyan Hampstead, Cyan and Hampstead Health Authority, the claimant's son was seriously injured in a motorcycle accident and he was taken to hospital. He went into a coma and died 14 days after the accident and the claimant remained at his son's bedside throughout and suffered psychiatric injury as a result of witnessing his son's deterioration. He claimed against the hospital, alleging that the negligent treatment of his son caused him to suffer psychiatric injury. And the court decided, as there was no sudden horrifying event, but a gradual decline in some condition, there was no claim. But we have seen in certain cases where courts have decided that this could amount to a sudden appreciation of horrifying events if you've got a bunch of discrete events. So in North Glamorgan, NHS Trust and Walters, the doctors negligently failed to diagnose the claim as 10-month-old son's liver failure. He was taken by ambulance to another hospital for a liver transplant, followed by the claimant in a car. Now on arrival, she was told her son had suffered severe brain damage following a seizure. The next day she agreed to his life support system being turned off and he died, and she suffered a pathological grief reaction as a result of what she'd witnessed over 36 hours. So there were discrete events, but of course, they made a one horrifying event. And in Gally Atkinson and Seagal, the claimant's 16 year old daughter was killed in a crash and she arrived at the scene of an accident after her daughter had been removed. Now hysterical, she was taken to a mortuary and saw her daughter's body which was badly disfigured and she suffered severe shock. Now the court appeal decided that in this case the immediate aftermath was the uninterrupted series of events from the time of the accident up till the claimant left the mortuary. It was different from the victims in Alcock who visited the mortuary for 8 hours after the events and when the claimants knew of the, exist the events had taken place. Now the claim may also be allowed if there's a series of uninterrupted events as we've seen in the previous case. We also then need to consider whether the claimant possesses reasonable fortitude. Now you may see this described as reasonable phlegm and fortitude but it amounts to the same thing. So psychiatric damage needs to be reasonably foreseeable and a person with reasonable fortitude or strength would have sustained the injury. Now, if the person has a thin skull or an unusually weak character, then a person of reasonable fortitude would not suffer the injury, then the person injured cannot claim. If he has a thin skull and a person of reasonable fortitude would have suffered injury, he can claim for the full extent of his injuries. So what we're looking at here is, the starting point is when it needs to affect a reasonable person. If it does affect or would affect a reasonable person, we can claim. If it would affect a reasonable person claim, we, we can actually claim for the full extent. And it's simple. It doesn't need to take into account any weaknesses and make it easier to prove. In Sims and British Steel, the claimant here suffered a head injury at work, which he, uh, following which he suffered depression. Now, he was able to claim as a person of reasonable fortitude, but also have suffered in these circumstances. And we have a final issue. Now, this will not come up in most cases. But a primary victim doesn't owe a duty to a secondary victim. What this means is if the victim is injured or killed because of his own negligence, a witness who sees that will not be able to claim against that person. So whether the injured or dead person or the estate of the dead person. Like in Greater X and Greater X, um, a father claims psychiatric damage 
by witnessing road traffic accident where his son was injured due to his own negligent driving and his claim failed. Now the son here was a primary victim and the father was a secondary victim. So that covers all of the main issues surrounding secondary victims. But there are indeed other types of claimants, so you may need to keep these in mind. So you may have a person who is an unwilling participant in an accident who mistakenly believes his actions have led to the harm of others, as in duly and camel led. Bystanders might also be considered other type of claimant, but of course there are rules for primary victims applicable here. Uh, property owners as well, we see your property damaged and near misses, again, primary victims. So, a person who is unwilling participant in an accident or who mistakenly believe his actions have led to the harm of others, we could look to Dooley for this. So Dooley was a crane operator and feared for the life of his colleagues when his load dropped in an area he knew them to be as a result of the provision of rope which was too thin. So he thought it was his fault and he suffered serious mental injury and couldn't go back to work, although none of his colleagues were actually injured. Now, Dooley could recover damages for, from his employers for shock as a result of their negligence. For bystanders, if they do nothing to help, then they cannot claim. If they do something to help, they become a rescuer. But they can only claim as a bystander if they, if they satisfy the Alcock criteria, so they do become a secondary victim. Um, in McFarlane and Caledonia, the claimant here is of a psychiatric injury when witnessing explosions and the rescuing of survivors on the, pipe, the Piper Alpha oil rig. Now, bystanders are not rescuers and have to satisfy all of the Alcock criteria, as you can see. For property owners, a tear in British gas, um, a woman witnessed the property being destroyed by fire due to the defender's negligence and suffers severe shock. Now, a claim for nervous shock can be made if it was caused by witnessing the destruction of your own property. So that psychiatric injury destruction of property is possibly a claim, but again, this is very unlikely to be a part of a scenario question. It could be something like multi-choice, for example. Now, near misses can also be classed as primary victims, but they must be within the zone of danger, as discussed earlier on in this video. So we covered then all of the main requirements. Negligence needs to be proven. There must be recognised psychiatric injury. There must be rules for primary victims and separate rules for secondary victims, as we've discussed. But we need to remember that in an application particularly, we need to remember that this is establishing a duty or putting a limit on duty, but we still need to prove breach of duty. Okay, so in the interests of completion, make sure we discuss the breach of duty. So has the, the person fallen below the standard expected of them? And indeed, causation. So is the defender factual cause of the psychiatric harm? Is the defender the legal cause of the psychiatric harm? Was it too remote? So these rules still apply. And of course, conclude, just consider, does liability exist? So that will be in your application question, and of course, in any application of psychiatric injury. So that's the video complete. There will be a separate video on exactly how to apply the law, but this is just discussing the theory. Thank you for watching.